Hey everybody, in today's lecture, I will be discussing the basic anatomy and behavior of the crayfish. For the behavior of the crayfish, I will be focusing on their molting and mating behaviors in addition to their social structure. To jump right into this lecture, we have the basic crayfish anatomy. Crayfish are classified as a clawed crustacean. There are over 600 species of crayfish in the world, but this diagram is representing the most common species in the United States, the Orusticus. As a clawed crustacean, one of the most important structures on their body is their pinchers, otherwise known as the chelipeds. The purpose of the pinchers is that they are used mostly in defense of the crayfish, during fighting, both over resources and potential mates. Furthermore, they are key in resource gathering, especially as they are able to chop plants and kill smaller prey. Moving upwards from the pinchers, there are the antenna and antennulae. These structures are extremely important as the crayfish explores the environment and other wildlife through the sensation of touch. The sensory perception of touch is one of the most important structures in the crayfish, especially as they are a night active species. The antenna and antennulae are able to detect topochemical signals within the water that relies messages between the crayfish. It relays messages about their social structure and reproductive status. Despite the heavy reliance on the antenna and antennulae, for the environment exploration, the crayfish does have a compound eye directly behind these structures. It has been indicated by Chidester 1912 that crayfish are unable to detect stationary objects due to the composition of the eye. Stretching almost across the entire surface of the cray crayfish is the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton acts as a layer of protection for the crayfish as it forms a tough shell around the crustacean. The exoskeleton is also the apparatus that the crayfish breathes through. The exoskeleton needs to be shed in order for the crayfish to grow as it does not change shape once it is fully developed. When the crayfish is molting, the carapace or the area of the exoskeleton located on their back is where the crayfish escapes through. But before the crayfish is able to molt, the carapace must be dried out completely, which prompts the crayfish to surface. When handling a crayfish, this is the area that should be grabbed in order to avoid being pinched by the crayfish. You should get your fingers behind the pinchers on the carapace. The final area of the crayfish is the tail and abdomen. It is most often used for mobility within the crayfish. In order to escape from predators, the crayfish will rapidly flick their tails, which shoots them back very quickly. They will perform this behavior when the crayfish is also first picked up by humans, and it will result in water shooting at that human. However, underneath the tail, is this, where the swimmerettes are located, is the most sensitive area on the crayfish. They will tuck their tail after the initial tail flick when they are picked up in order to protect this area from being touched. As mentioned on the last slide, the carapace is important in the process of molting as it separates away from the abdomen as represented in the picture. The crayfish can then slip out of the created gap to escape the exoskeleton and properly grow. They will undergo this process approximately 11 times, at which point they will be seen as fully grown. However, the overall frequency of when the crayfish grows and molts will depend on the environment that it is housed in. For optimal molting, temperature, oxygen level, and food content is extremely important. For temperature, it should be maintained around 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Furthermore, the environment must have high oxygen levels, although the exact levels have yet to be investigated by scientists. In the tank setting, there should not be stagnant water, as that environment is known to have low oxygen content. So, cir to circumvent this issue, an air stone or filter can be used to rise the oxygen levels. Finally, the food content is crucial for regrowing the exoskeleton, especially with the access of calcium carbonate. During the molting process, they will fully consume their previous exoskeleton over a two to three day period to regain some calcium content. 
As the crayfish grows during the molting process, they are actually able to regrow entire limbs through the process of regeneration. If they are attempting to regrow the pinchers, it will take a couple molts to fully grow as they are one of the bigger structures on the crayfish. In experiments, for example, crayfish could be easily identified by the limbs they currently have as they readily lose and gain them. Since the crayfish do not pose, possess the exoskeleton during this process, they are extremely vulnerable from other predators and other crayfish. Crayfish are known to have cannibalistic tendencies due to their territoriality, and it most often occurs during this vulnerable period. As a result, the crayfish tends to burrow deep during this entire process in order to have the best chance at survival. Another important stage in the crayfish's life is their reproductive cycle, which can actually happen year-round, but it mostly is dependent on the temperature of the water that they're housed in. Crayfish are incapable of distinguishing between males and females, similarly to the struggles that most ha humans have when handling them. This results in males attempting to mate with other males. In order for us to tell them apart, you must flip them onto their backs as they look identical from the top. To determine the sex of the crayfish, one has to look at the junction between the abdomen and thorax, which will be protected by the curled tail when they are first picked up, as I discussed previously. As pictured on the right, the males have an extra pair of swimmerettes that act as a reproductive organ. On the other hand, the females have a rounded seminal receptacle. Now for the actual mating process, the males must first identify another crayfish. He will approach and attempt to subdue the female with his pinchers. At this point, the male will flip the female onto her back and deposit his spermatophore into her seminal receptacle. This does not fertilize her eggs as they are in a separate cavity. Instead, she is storing the spermatophore until the conditions are optimal for fertilization. She can continue to store it for multiple months. Once the conditions are optimal, the fem female will lay the eggs out of her oviduct. The eggs will pass over the seminal receptacle and be fertilized if she was in fact mated by a male. If she was not mated, the eggs will turn, turn an orange color instead of a dark brown and naturally fall off as seen in this picture. She may consume the unfertilized eggs, but it is not ne a necessity. If the eggs are fertilized, they will stick to the swimmerettes of the female for two to four weeks, depending on the environment. She is highly protective of her eggs during this period and may be seen rocking them during extremely stressful situations. Overall, she will have approximately 300 eggs per breeding cycle. However, the majority of the eggs may not survive after hatching due to a high mortality rate. When the eggs hatch, the babies will remain on the mother for two to three days, at which point they will be crawling all over her and exploring their surroundings. After three days, she will actually start to consume her offspring, especially in a tank setting where they cannot escape the mother. One reason the mother may begin to consume the offspring is due to their high instances of territoriality surrounding resources such as food, space, and shelter. The crayfish have a dominance-based hierarchy where the best fighters, normally the larger crayfish, become the most dominant individual both in the wild and a tank setting. This means that the crayfish has a higher chance of getting the best resources in an environment. The crayfish will communicate their status within the hierarchy through chemo signals that are received via the antenna, which may influence the frequency of agonistic behaviors, otherwise known as aggressive bouts, between individuals. However, most crayfish will still perform agonistic behaviors when it is centered on resource acquisition, especially with shelters, according to Bergman and Moore 2005. When monitoring crayfish, most agonistic behaviors have a set formula. First, the crayfish will locate each other with the antenna, and they strike a posturing pose by raising the pinchers at one another, as demonstrated by the picture on the slide. 
If one crayfish does not retreat at this point, the crayfish will charge and attempt to grab one another with the pinchers. The one crayfish will flip the other onto their back, and the fight will end with either the retreat via the tail flick behavior, limb loss, or death of one crayfish. However, the fight could end with a combination of all three, depending on the size and temperament of the different crayfish. The overall frequency of agonistic behaviors will depend on the composition of an environment and the personal history of the crayfish. Crayfish are capable of undergoing the winner effect due to their memory capabilities, as the crayfish will actually remember winning previous fights and their instances of agonistic behaviors will increase. Furthermore, they can remember the ownership of previous resources, which again will affect the amount of agonistic behaviors displayed by a crayfish. Thank you for listening for my quick overview of the anatomy and basic behavior of the crayfish which will be useful when designing and implementing experiments with the crayfish. If you have further questions, feel free to email me at the address listed below. Thank you again.